Hi there. My name is Jim Bell, full name James Dalton Bell. I'm here because of something I wrote 22 years ago. The text is on the website. I put the the uh, the uh, text of the name of the, the website up there. I had intended originally to read the whole thing to you, but it's up there now under Prague speech. The reason I don't really want to read the, the whole text to you is because things are boring just to be read to people. And I think you could probably read it a lot faster, particularly using translation devices, that I can give it to you. Now, I've been handing out cards yesterday and today. I hope by now all of you at least have the opportunity to read the first part of the assassination politics essay and the press release and purpose of the organization. 22 years ago, I wrote a very controversial essay, and I gave it the extremely provocative name, Assassination Politics. Instead of 51% of the politicians, or people voting on which politician to occupy the office, I proposed that a much smaller number of people can decide which politician won't ever be in an office again. It was received with shock with a lot of people, but nothing even close to the amount of shock I had that 22 years later, people haven't properly addressed this idea. There have only been two, what I call, intelligent analyses of my AP idea. One was an, an Indian um, jet fighter pilot named R. Sukumaran, S-U-K-U-M-A-R-A-N, who wrote an essay on the event of about 2004 when the federal government of the United States proposed an idea which was suspiciously close to my idea. It was dubbed Terrorism Futures by the news media. And they had proposed offering a betting market for terrorist acts on the theory that if somebody knew that a terrorist act was going to happen, they would people would bet on it, the price would rise like a stock market, and if it ever happens, the guy who predicted the event, the snitch in other words, would get the money. Well, I, I was in a particular place at the time that that came out. I was in... Uh, a federal prison, <laughs> and apparently all my fellow prisoners, well, they knew that I was a nerd, I was a tech person, and apparently they all knew, when they saw this on the news, he said, that's Jim Bell's system right there, because they do enough from talking to each other. Well, my assassination politics system was basically the idea that if that if a politician is doing what he shouldn't be doing, you won't want him there. And you might be willing to pay some money to see him gone forever. But you might only want to pay him a euro. And who is going to do something about him for a euro? Or, well, Bitcoin is closer to them. But again, that's not a lot of money. But I, I thought... When, before I told anybody else about this idea, I thought, why don't we combine our donations? Uh, Bitcoin from you, or well, at the time Bitcoin did it, a dollar from you, a euro from you, uh, whatever, and collect this money in a pot, not a physical pot, you understand, but an electronic pot, and somebody out, out there will predict that that particular bad politician would die on October 8th, 2017. And uh, when that happens, the person gets the pot. Uh, well, I put this, I decided when I was, after I wrote there, after I thought of this idea, for a number of weeks, I was very, very careful 
I had this funny grin on my face. I had, uh, to, to paraphrase Dr. Seuss and the Grinch Stole Christmas, if anybody are familiar with that cartoon, I said, I said to somebody, I said, I've thought of a awfully wonderful, wonderfully awful idea. And there is, in fact, a section, section two of my essay, which has literally occur, occurred the way I said. Uh, I, I was in a place called Rosslyn, Washington, a place called Village Pizza, which you actually see in the credits for a Northern Exposure TV show. Her name was Dorothy, and she has a last name, but I'm not going to reveal it because, well, not unless she agrees. We were going up there to to celebrate Northern Exposure, the TV show that was on 25 years ago. Well, we sat down, and she knew that I was inv an inventor, and she said to me, Jim, uh, what other inventions are you working on? And I said to her, well, I have a new idea, but it's really revolutionary. And I said, literally, it's revolutionary. She came back to me and she said, well, okay, what government are you planning to overthrow? And I said, all of them. <laughs> Each and every one. <laughs> uh, the shock I had over the next 22 years is that the world has not taken the bull by the horns and actually addressed my idea. We have Kim Jong-un threatening to throw nuclear bombs every which way. We have uh, Venezuela, the government there throwing, you know, running the place into the ground. We have Syria poisoning its people with sarin, chlorine, and other awful chemicals. Now, how, how do I know how awful they are? I have a degree in chemistry from MIT. And believe me, I've had a lot of awful chemicals in my parents' basement, which I knew how to deal with, but most people don't when they get dropped on you from 20,000 feet. Uh, I have a solution to that. I have a solution to nuclear weapons. And I had a solution 22 years ago. If you don't want somebody using nuclear weapons or even having them, you find out who has them and say, I'm going to donate a couple dollars to see you dead if you don't dismantle those weapons immediately and show it on TV and invite people and make sure everybody knows that all the nuclear weapons are dead. They're gone. They're not coming back. All right? This was my idea. Before I told anybody about part one of the essay, the reason I had a grin on my face is because I'd solved that problem. Well, 22 years later, have you solved that problem? No. Is it because you had a better solution? No. You didn't have a solution. You still don't have a solution. Kim Jong-un has bombs. Pakistan has bombs. India has bombs. That's great. There's plenty of others. Uh, so that's the idea I had. <sighs> So a few weeks ago, I was considering giving what would be, for me, a, a usual speech. The same thing I said more or less in Acapulco a few weeks ago. But then it occurred to me, why not just not talk about it, do something about it? And I thought, what can I do about it? This requires publicity talking, really amplified by uh, internet. And I thought, yeah, that's fine, but that costs money, that takes time, and that doesn't generate the enthusiasm necessarily, unless you have enough background and backing. So I thought, what can I do to liven things up a bit? I decided to finance this thing by, for, by asking for a thousandth of your bitcoins. One in a thousand. If you're lucky enough to have a thousand bitcoins, I want one of them. If you have a ten bitcoins, I want a hundredth of one. Okay? A thousandth of your assets in bitcoins and litecoins and ETH, Ethereum. 
Why do I want this? Is it because I really need that particular thing? Well, I could, I, <laughs> no, because I need to start an operation. I need to hire the best people, philosophers, mathematicians, programmers, uh, people in general who think of ideas, and I want them to do the analysis on the assassination politics idea that hasn't been done in 20 years. Okay, the thing that I thought when I was the only one in the world who knew about it, thought this is exactly what the world needs. And once they hear about it, it'll just be virtually automatic. They'll want to learn more. But no, it didn't happen. And I thought, what would it do if I were to ask for a thousandth of a Bitcoin? Well, four years ago, November of uh, 2013, a guy named Sanjuro, or I nicknamed Sanjuro, uh, who nobody knew about and I didn't know about, I got a, I guess it was a Tor sent email from Mr. Sanjuro. Mr. Sanjuro said to me, hi there, thank you very much, I'm going to implement your idea uh, and you know, thank you for the idea. And I thought, okay. For, for one thing, the first thing I thought is, oh, great, somebody's going to actually do it. Second thing I said, oh, well, I, I responded in one email. I said, I said, yeah, great, thank you. Second, I said, be really, really careful. Because for obvious reasons, a person who proposes running this system is going to be at a certain amount of risk. And I didn't say it directly to him immediately, but I did say in the cypherpunks list, if you know what that is, I said, I think he's making a mistake. Now, it wasn't that he was making this mistake of trying to implement my system. Whether he actually intended to do it, we do not know. His mistake was he was accepting only as a minimum donation one Bitcoin. All right? Now, when I wrote my assassination politics essay back in 1995, I was talking about donations of a dollar, 50 cents, 25 cents, even a dime. I was not talking of donations of $300, because that's about what the Bitcoin was worth, maybe 200 250 That's That's not what I was thinking of. I was talking about a million of donations of a dollar each. And now maybe the reason why is because he had to process all the donations by hand. I don't know. I'm just guessing here. And that may be because he didn't have an automated system to do it. That was one possible explanation. Is it, but if you go back and you look at the price of Bitcoin during the period of October and November of 2000 or of uh, 2013, came from approximately, one figure I remember was like $206 in middle of October. I think it was up to about three or 350 at the time that I recall he sent me his email. Remember, I didn't know who this guy was. And I, I suggested as at the end of my message that he contact an American journalist named Andy Greenberg. Now, Andy Greenberg was a journalist that originally contacted me in the summer of 2011 while I was in prison at Sheridan, Oregon, and he wanted to get a hold of me. They wouldn't let him or me uh, uh, have an interview with him, so I immediately wrote a letter, five pages typed, and I, said, I, I told him a lot about what had been happening to me and what the government was doing wrong and badly. Well, he, event, he didn't write an article immediately, as far as I know, but he started writing a book, and the book uh, was called, uh, let's see, uh, what, what was Andy Greenberg's book? I just can't. What's that? 
Ah, yes, yeah, sorry about that. Pardon me. I'm 59 years old. I can, my memory has been very good in my life, but, uh, okay. Uh, Mr. Greenberg wrote a lot of stuff about me, and I won't claim it's as far as it being libelous. No, no, it wasn't. The problem is that a lot of it was just somewhat inaccurate. I won't, I won't go into the details of, of what was inaccurate. There's a lot of things. But they were things that if I could have just told him, hey, that's wrong, this is the correct, I wouldn't demand you know, a veto power on what he wanted to write, but I could have corrected what he had said in the end. One of the most innocuous things I could have corrected him on was this. Back in 2000. Well, let's see, 2000 or so, a journalist wrote about me that I was six foot three inch. All right? Do I look like I'm six foot three inch? I've been six foot zero inch for the last 40 plus years. But that journalist back 2000 wrote I was six foot three. And I think maybe, I don't know whether Andy Greenberg wrote and said that, but that was what it was. Now, do you know why these people all thought I was six foot three inch? Well, my picture was taken in front of those height rulers at a place called, uh, 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 let's see, SeaTac Federal Detention Center in SeaTac, Washington. And that thing looks like I, w I was six foot three inch. I only found out 10 years later why everybody was thinking I was six foot three. Turns out when I got back to this place, I checked very carefully. Somebody had nailed the thing to the wall wrong, so it showed that everybody was three inches higher than they actually were. That was where that extra three inches came in. Okay, all right. That shows you how competent federal government employees that work for the, the Bureau of Prisons really are. All right. If you look at the Bitcoin price between October and November of 2013, it goes up from about $200 to $1,100. All right? I, what I should have done when I got that email, <laughs> I should have sold everything I had and bought bitcoins. <laughs> I wish I could say I had been smart enough to do that. I don't think of myself as being a particularly devious person. But the fact that I only re recently realized that was probably all it was. <sighs> oh, I'm sorry, but what can I say? It occurred to me a few weeks ago, if I ask for everybody's thousandth Bitcoin, one thousandth of your Bitcoins, it's going to induce a lot of interest in the Bitcoin market. Why? Well, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to finally see the AP system analyzed to death. If there's a fault, I want people to find it. If there's an error, I want people to fix it. And eventually, after all this publicity and news and talking about it, once it works, if nobody else does it, I want, I will implement it myself with anybody who will help. All right? Now, as I said, I would prefer somebody else actually implement it. I never wrote my essay with the idea that I would be the one to implement it, because I figured the desirability of the system would be self-apparent to anybody who looked at the system. It hasn't happened yet. I think the public needs to be told, and when they get over their shock, they will react as a lot of people do with a funny grin and say, that's what the world needs. I think eventually it will be implemented, but 
maybe by then the politicians and government employees will be ready to leave because they will see that it's not safe for them to stick around. Well, I believe that as a product of my asking for that thousandth Bitcoin, and if I get a substantial number, let's say I get a thousand, a thousand Bitcoins, I can, I can make a huge project with hiring a lot of people who are competent and can find whatever error remains in the AP concept and then publicize the idea to enough people and get a consensus. And I'm not talking about 51% of the people consensus. AP has the magical ability that you don't need 51% of the people to decide, let's do it. If you had 1% of the people decide, let's do it, it would work. If you had 10% of the people decide, let's do it, it would work really, really well. Most people would never actually have to donate to the system. Why? Because we all agree, who, well, I shouldn't say we all agree who the bad point people are. We all agree that there are bad people and those people need to be taken out of office. Or these people need to be convinced to resign permanently from their offices. So it is quite conceivable that if I start getting a substantial set of donations, the price of Bitcoin could go up. If it went up as much as San Juro's effort, and by the way, nobody knows, nobody knows who San Juro was or is. I can promise you it wasn't me, all right? I, the only contact I had with San Juro was one email to me and one email back over the Tor network to him. If on the strength of one proposal publicized by Andy Greenberg to the rest of the world, and by the way, within one day of Andy Greenberg's article, there were about a hundred other articles that appeared by other journalists on the internet mirroring basically what Andy Greenberg said. Oh, let me tell you this. Let me explain why Andy Greenberg is a little bit more important to this than you might imagine. I had read Andy Greenberg's book, This Machine Killed Secrets, and I told you that there were a number of things that were inaccurate, and he didn't even bother to, to get me my view on some of these issues. I wasn't feeling particularly happy about Andy Greenberg. I wanted to do Andy Greenberg a dirty deed. So when San Juro showed up, I thought, hmm, what could I do? How could I manipulate the system to do something bad to Andy Greenberg? So I said, okay, San Juro, please contact journalist Andy Greenberg, who has been helpful to me in the past, and he might be interested in publicizing your idea. Because I was trying to get Andy Greenberg thrown a hot potato. Now, can you imagine getting thrown a hot potato? Where you, you, you can't catch it because it's too hot. I wanted to put Andy Greenberg in a very embarrassing situation. Later on, I was going to say, Andy Greenberg was told about this system, and he didn't want to write an article about it. Well, <sighs> the problem is that a week later, after I sent that email back through the Tor network to this guy named San Juro, much to my surprise, Andy Greenberg actually wrote an article about this in Forbes magazine, and a day later, a hundred articles appeared all over the internet. It became an explosion of publicity, and <laughs> I was astounded. And the price of Bitcoin shot up. I, it might have been around 350 at the time the article appeared. I was, I, you'd have to go back and do the check. But it went up to $1,100. So somebody was buying Bitcoin in the early October, I guess, in anticipation of all this. 
somebody sent me an email and I told him to go to Andy Greenberg. And Andy Greenberg did what I didn't expect him to do. And he wrote an article and the price of Bitcoin went to $1,100. Well, guess what? Suppose you're out there and you have a Bitcoin. Or you have, you have a lot of Bitcoins, but let's say you consider one Bitcoin you have. If you give me a thousandth of a Bitcoin, what would happen if the price of Bitcoin went up by a factor of three? Which is about what it did after Sanjuro's article appeared. Well, you've given me a, a thousandth of your Bitcoin, so you have 0.999 Bitcoins left. You know, you might wonder, why should you give this guy even a thousandth of a Bitcoin? Well, that the remaining 0.999 Bitcoins, if it triples in value, let's say, I don't know the current value, maybe it's like $4,400 today or something equivalent. All right, if that $4,400 Bitcoin and you take off $4.4 dollars because you've given me a thousandth, if that triples in value, that you then have about... 1300 and 200 13,200 so you're better off by $8,800 and I'm $4 richer of course that $4 may be multiplied by the increase in value or something so so you might say you're you're doing me a favor by giving me that four point four dollars equivalent, but on the other hand, I'm doing you guys a favor by making the price of Bitcoin go up by whatever it goes up, a factor of three. Now the difference between me, me and Sanjuro is probably a lot of things, but one thing is nobody knew who Sanjuro was, nobody knows who he is. He didn't do what he said he was going to do. I will. I'll be around. Everybody knows who I am. And when I say I'm going to research it and publicize it and debate it, and I'm serious. I'm going to do it. Now, whether I will implement it and actually run it, that's decisions that have to be made in the future. I believe that as a consequence of my project, the Bitcoin price should double, triple, or even quadruple, quite possibly in the next few weeks. All right? Now, so far, I've only publicized this at this uh, meeting, or this, you know, this, uh, this organization. But shortly, there is going to be publicity coming out. So I'm different than Sanjuro. I actually intend to do what I say I'm going to do. And I think I have even more credibility than Sanjuro. Sanjuro is simply a person who took a, a screen name of a character in a couple of Japanese early 60s samurai movies, and he made a claim. I'm going to implement Jim Bell's AP system. That's all he said. And yet the price of Bitcoin went up, all, all told, between before he was, you know, $206 or whatever, all the way up to $1,100. And $300, from $300 to $1,100 after the article appeared. So I suggest that my statement of what I intend to do is far more credible than a fictional name, Sanjuro, what he said he was going to do. So if you were betting on which one to bet on, you'd bet on me because I'm sticking around. I'm not, I'm not somebody you don't know. I'm a, I wrote that essay and I published it in my own name, Jim Bell. Okay, well, what my true name is James Dalton Bell, but on the internet I always go as Jim Bell. I could have published it anonymously. Sure, I could have. Uh, I would have spared myself a whole lot of shit. Sorry about that. But as far as I knew, the wisdom of the concept uh, would be apparent to all who saw it. 
that it took 22 years surprised me most of all. So I have a good reason to start this project, to do the things that should have been done 22 years ago. But I want the people who donate to this project to get back way, way more money than they actually do donated. As much as a thousand times as much. If the price of Bitcoin goes up by three and they donate me a thousandth of their Bitcoin, they will be far ahead in the game. And I intend to do the project that I say. I will, in fact, hire people or volunteers or whatever, and they will analyze the AP idea and prepare the world through publicity for the concept. Isn't that what we want? Uh, part of it will, will be polling people, literally asking people, do you think you want to have this thing operate? Everybody has a say. I will, in fact, challenge people like governments and say, look, this proposal will eliminate you as a government. What is your, and I'll say, what is your re reaction to that? Why shouldn't you be killed? Why, why is government necessary anyway? They won't have an answer. Remember the statistic. In the 20th century, 260 million people were killed by government action. In fact, if you consider that wrong, wouldn't you consider, for example, it would be better if, oh, say, two million government employees had been killed and no civilians? Isn't that an improvement on society? I think it is. Anyway, the speech that I intended to give is on the web. It's on at that website. It's labeled, confusingly, Prague speech. And... I'm serious, okay? I'm serious. When we have Kim Jong-un threatening to throw nuclear weapons at us, or wherever he wants to send them, you know, uh, people in, uh, for example, Tokyo, probably ought to feel rather nervous. They have a whole lot of money tied up in something called Tokyo. And uh, not since Godzilla has threat to Tokyo been as serious as this. Seoul, North, uh, South Korea, for one, but his, but Kim Jong Un's rockets go easily to Seattle and San Francisco and Los Angeles. I happen to live in Vancouver, Washington, which is a small community across the Columbia River from Portland, Oregon. The only reason we're probably at risk is because if they have an inaccurate targeting system and they're trying for Portland, they might accidentally hit Vancouver. But I'm not, I'm not staying up at night worrying about that. Is it ethical to kill people's leaders to solve the problem? The federal government American federal government in uh, about 1983 published an executive order, 12333, that was the number. And it outlawed, it banned federal government's use of assassination of foreign leaders. That may have sounded nice. Man, okay, that's, we're not going to engage in assassination. But why did they do that? For good reasons or for bad reasons? One of the problems with using assassination against your enemies of the leadership is that they could use assassination to kill your enemies. As I think I said in the essay, the assassination politics essay, The leaders of your country and my country and the other guy's country have a lot more in common with each other than they do with you. They drive in the same expensive automobiles, they fly in the same jets, they eat the same good food, and God forbid, if you kill one of their leaders, they kill one of your leaders. And I'm not talking about the action, reaction of the ordinary citizen. I'm talking about the leadership. 
Does the leadership want to engage in actions that might end up resulting in their own deaths eventually? I don't think they do. Which is why when that executive order two or 12333 three, three came out, this wasn't a good news, this was bad news. Because what it meant was that if any time in the last 32 or 33, 34 years, the federal government of the United States had the ability to kill Kim Jong-il or Kim Jong-un or Assad, the president of Syria, or something like that, they would have said officially, no, we're not going to do that. In other words, and make very, very clear, they would gladly send thousands or millions of us to our deaths before they themselves are physically threatened. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Um, there was a king of England, was a king of England, named Richard III. And you may have been following the news over the last few years, and he found out where he was buried. Now, Richard III, I think, was the last king of England to die in battle. And he was written up in a Shakespeare play, which is probably why he became as famous as he was. He, he actually did battle. They don't do that anymore. Kings don't go into battle. If you're interested in something, I want to direct you to a movie. It was called, uh, the, well, The Surrogate or... Uh, Oh, what was the other name? Uh, the Challenge. It was about a 1970 TV movie in America. You almost will never... It's, it's on YouTube, by the way, for free, which is odd because YouTube tends to charge for movies. Actor, the main actor was Darren McGavin, and it had to do with a battle between the United States and an unnamed ally of Red China. That's what we used to call China, Red China, Communist China. Presumably it was North Korea. Apparently they had found some satellite that had fallen and there was going to be a war potentially if that stuff didn't get co collected back because it was, had a lot of secrets there. So they ended up solving the problem by sending two fighters onto this island. They evacuated the island, tended to set the two fighters there, and they started a, a two-man war. Now, eventually, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna kill the suspense. But it was, I saw that movie live on TV the first time in 1970, and I remembered it. It was called The Surrogate or The Challenge, depending on uh, where the source was. The, uh, but it was the idea that instead of thousands of ordinary people dying in a war, why don't you just have two people? Or in this case, maybe some leaders. If uh, the president of our country and the president of uh, that other country have a dispute, give them weapons and let them fight it out. How many wars do you think we would have if that was the rules? Not too many, would you, don't you think? Anyway, now you know what I want to do. You know what I want for it. I need a thousandth of your Bitcoins, a thousand of your Ethereum, a thousandth of your Litecoins. Uh, money is fungible. If you have lots of Ethereum and lots of Bitcoins, feel free to send in the appropriate amount. Do you think I'm being unfair to ask for one thousandth of your Bitcoins if, and by the way, you don't have to send them in immediately. Wait a few weeks. If the price of Bitcoin triples and you've made $8,000 or more on your Bitcoin, that during that rate, is it, fi is it reasonable to say a thousandth of $8,000? Is that, is that reasonable or unreasonable? Is anybody going to argue that, well, Bell, you didn't really do that. It was actually just some market fluctuation. 
I think most people around here would agree that if the price of Bitcoin triples in the next few weeks, it will because, be because of me. It's a good project. It'll be fun to do. It'll get people to think. And it might cause a lot of politicians to resign. Because I'm thoroughly convinced these people are afraid. They know what happens. Now, remember what happened in 1989? Are any of you old enough to actually remember 1989? I was very much old enough to, I am 59 and a half years old. I was born into an era where nuclear bombs on missiles was already an accepted reality, okay? My parents had to deal with the 50s. Did we ever see, uh, did you ever see the movie, The Day the Earth Stood Still? Everybody heard it, uh, that movie? The Day the Earth Stood Still? Good movie, you ought to watch it. 1951 movie. Uh, I better not ruin the suspense. Just watch the movie, The Day the World Stood Still. The concept then in 51 of nuclear bombs being paired with missiles was a whole new thing. Before then, a bomb had to come in by an aircraft, and I just spent going from New York City to Moscow yesterday eight hours in a modern jet plane. Now, you want to know why I was in Moscow? It's a long story. I was trying to go from Canada, from Toronto, or from Vancouver, Washington, to Toronto, to uh, Prague. But, oh no, the Canadian authorities, when I changed planes, found my record and says, no, we don't want you in in Canada. I said, well, just send me on to Prague. That's where I want to go. No, we can't do that. They said, we have to send you back to America. So they sent me back to New York City, where I hadn't been for about 30 years. And the people who ran this operation got me, had to get me there to Prague quickly and in, in a way that wouldn't risk another one of these being sent off back to somewhere else. In the end, they found two flights. One flight went through Moscow. The other flight went through uh, Turkey, Istanbul. And I had to decide which, which routing to take. And I thought, hmm. Keep in mind, I'm 59 years old. My, our, my, my country's relationship with Russia, or Soviet Union, wasn't very good when I was young, and still there was, I mean, it's not exactly a happy relationship now. So I had to decide, do I want to go through Moscow or do I want to go through Istanbul? And I thought, I want to go through Moscow. And you might wonder, well, why did I decide that? I'll tell you why. I figured the people, the, uh, the government of Turkey might actually be interested in doing a favor for the federal government of the United States by locking me up for a few days or weeks or months. Now, I have spent 13 years in prison in my life, and a little bit of prison doesn't bother me one bit. I've been in solitary confinement for a year, and I'm happy, okay? Solitary confinement is not nearly as bad for me, at least, as most people would think. I didn't want to give the Turkish government the opportunity to do the federal government of the United States a favor by locking me up for a week or two before I could get here. So I said, send me to Moscow, because I didn't think the Moscow would do the federal government of the United States a favor by locking me up. And in the end, maybe they just didn't, I don't know. Uh, they said they ignored me. They didn't pay attention to me, Russia didn't, and sent me on to Prague. Uh, Google search Vladimir Lenin sealed railroad car, if you want to know about my joking thoughts as I was going through Sheratomiv, Sheratomiv, 
whatever the name of the Moscow airport is, Sheremetyevo, is that right? Anyway, the Russians effectively allowed a sealed airplane to carry a revolutionary named Jim Bell <laughs> to get over, <laughs> to get to. Uh, it, it's really funny. I, I know it doesn't sound funny, but, but when you Google search Vladimir Yet Lenin sealed railroad car, you will understand what I was laughing about as I <laughs> as I left Shiramativu. Am I doing the right thing? Am I doing a wrong thing? I've had patience. I've had 22 years waiting for something to happen. You don't want to get bombed by a nuclear bomb. You don't want to get sent off to a war. All right? You don't want to have people in a country you never have seen to get gassed and murdered. Do you? Well, if you don't, then one of two things has to happen. Either you have to accept a proposal, or you have to find a better proposal to get rid of it. You can't just throw up your hands and say, we don't want to make a decision. Okay? Because that's effectively what you're doing. If you say, Jim, we don't like your idea. It's so icky. It's so weird. Well, it might have seemed weird by people back in 1995, but you guys have had 20, well, the ones that are old enough to remember, have had 22 years to think about it. And I'll tell you, if any one of you had thought of a better solution, I think you would have proposed it, <laughs> maybe anonymously. Maybe I should open it up to questions. Okay, Jim, thanks a lot for your presentation. I mean, I think many people will definitely think about it, including me. I have just two technical notes that can improve your project. The first thing is that the Bitcoin is not anonymous, as many people think. It's pseudo-anonymous. So I strongly recommend you to accept uh, truly anonymous cryptocurrencies as donation, like a Monero, for example, or Zcash. Uh, we are a big fan of Monero and also Zcash and uh, of all, all other truly cryptocurrencies because I think especially for this pre project most people would definitely appreciate donation in truly crypto uh, truly crypt cryptocurrencies and the second maybe totally crazy idea uh, maybe it, w it would be good idea just to create ICO for a project <laughs> Okay, so, questions? <laughs> so, I haven't read your essay, and I'm eager to read it, but this reminds me about uh, some way golden period of anarchy, where most, a lot of anarchists killed uh, kings and uh, country representatives in a, in a period where they had a uh, a, a very Im big importance in the cool, in the culture of people, and this caused a, a big change in the in the culture. It's, it, they, they they removed this concept of the king of being something inviolable, and as reaction, the system had to invent Interpol and other and other things. But the, it it the the impact was the finally positive, but yet yet we have uh, this oppressive system again. How do you compare your your idea and how it, it's an improvement on the on this historical okay. leaders killing? What I'm proposing essentially amounts to a, a revolution. But the problem is that almost every revolution in history has been either bad or a disaster. Because usually what happens is governments get taken over by or from bad people and it goes into the hands of people who are possibly equally bad. That I do not believe is possible using the AP system. Why? Because it will continually operate after that to take down any threatening governmental system. It's not just that 
It's not just the first guy that you're trying to take down. It's the second guy and the third guy and the fourth guy and the fifth guy, okay? And even if they lock the top guy into a bunker in the concrete, he has to have people outside so you target them too. If eventually, they can't act. They can't do anything against you if they can't even show their face. And everybody, all of their assistants can't show their faces. I believe that this is an un, uncorruptible system to a first and second and third approximation. And it will continue to eliminate government governments out there. Okay, another question? So, uh, I, uh, Jim, I have a question. Assassination markets, assassination politics. Yep. It's assassin uh, assassination politics is an assassination market aimed at politicians. Basically, yes. Yes. Now, the last talk, and many people here believe that the true political power is moving away from politicians to technologists. So could you imagine that there would be an assassination market for technologists, for scientists, for people who do shitty ICOs, for these <laughs> sort of things? And in which case, maybe you could, maybe Ted Kaczynski would be kind of, you know, his idea was that we should murder technologists. So I think that the issue that I have with assassination markets is how do you prevent people you don't want being assassinated for being assassinated? Or do you actually think politicians will always be the most unpopular people in the world? Well, I had, I considered that before I wrote part one of AP. Uh, look at look at the end of part seven. I said what I said. Uh, when the AP system starts running, if it if it accepted all donations and all bets, there might end up being millions of people who were previously in power or thrown out of power, and they'd still have their money though probably, and they would be looking for an enemy, and they would find one in me, and they would have the technology to get and retaliate against me. So I said, I might be the first victim of the operating AEP system. What decision did I make? Did I shut up? No, I published. Read end of part seven in AP. I anticipated this. In the, I'd like to end by, or that comment by saying, uh, If I ran the system initially for the first, say, couple of years, I'd have a rule that says only politicians and government employees could be named. Why? Because there would be no decision-making system like a court system like we currently have. So if, if we name only government employees, they've already collected their money by taxation. They've already offended us with respect to the the non-aggression principle, the principle of libertarianism. So I would feel comfortable with having a system simply say that every government employee is targetable. After that, after the government's been taken down, there has to be set up a new system. While it would be theoretically possible to replace the criminal justice system of every nation with the fascination politics, the problem is there needs to be things called investigation and fact-finding and decision-making. So I thought, even before I wrote the first part of it, I realized that ultimately we're going to have to end up producing the, the post-AP equivalent of the criminal justice system. Oh, they would, have, they would be using the same buildings. There would be, be multiple court systems. It would be voluntary. Nobody would be forced into court. They'd be forced into court if they were convicted, or if they're charged with a crime in the sense that they don't want somebody to just donate them to death. They want to be able to say that they're, you know, I didn't steal the car, I, my wife was having a baby, I had to take it to the hospital or something like that. There has to be extenuating circumstances. And if so, you don't just do, accept money to kill them. Well, okay, that's fine. We'll have, well, we look sort of like a today's court system, but it'll be based on entirely different principles. Those kind of things are needed and will be implemented. 
eventually. And that's part of what my Jim Bell project is. We need to design a new society to replace what we have today. Next question. Uh, just now to, to your question. Uh, what you describe, uh, it's already here happened in the past. Uh, there were some primitivist uh, attacks, you know, who, who are primitivist. They, they really made, made terroristic attack uh, against some scientists and they killed some scientists just because ideologically they are strongly against technological evolution or technology at all. Just this already happened in the past. Another question. It seems to me that after the first assassination market is complete and we move on to the second one because there's no more government and like you said, we would have to build something else. Um, an unforeseen consequence could be like people won't use Facebook anymore because no one wants their face out there. You know, <laughs> people will stop trying to be famous. People will stop doing frivolous things for fame and glory because they would be targetable. Um, do you have any other unforeseen results or hard to predict results that you've thought about as a um, consequence of these types of uh, economic reward systems? Yes, I did go through precisely that kind of analysis before I wrote part one. One thing I, I question is the, is the issue about villains in movies. Actors have long said that it's more interesting to play a villain than a good guy in a movie. You can be a villain a lot easier and better than a good guy. But what happens if your job is playing a villain in the movies? Is it possible that people will donate to you just because you're a villain? You know, you're a bad guy. And I thought, how would you make movies under those circumstances? Well, hopefully, hopefully, people will see through the fact the guy is not really a villain, he's just a good actor playing a villain. That's one possibility. Another possibility is, well, the actor who plays villains might be paid a lot more than the good guy. Why? Because he's taking a risk. Uh, yes, that's a very valid thing. Now, though Facebook did not exist when I thought of this idea. I mean, Facebook, I guess, was thought of what? eight or nine years later, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I recognized, <laughs> I recognized there was a risk to being a public figure. Yes, it's going to change things. Yeah, I say in my essay, you know, if, if, you, if you ask yourself the question, what's going to change in society when AP is implemented? I really, it would take, and I said it would take a lot less time to answer what would remain the same. It's going to have to be a new society, all right? It's going to be, well, what you know, you've heard the the the, the saying, Chinese saying, uh, "May you live in interesting times," because to a Chinese or most other people, interesting times meant war and famine and disasters, okay? So that's a curse when you say, may you live in interesting times. Well, I believe long before I publicized the essay, at Assassination Publics, it's going to actually usher in a, a very boring society. People who cause trouble are not going to want to cause trouble anymore. It'll be a polite society. Have you ever heard the saying, an armed society is a polite society? Now, I know most of you are Europeans, and you're a, so your, your reaction to guns is probably different than me and Americans' reaction to guns. Huh? Reaction? Well, what do you mean? Well, I don't know. It depends on your definition of rational. One of my best friends I, uh, for, for many years is a guy who lived up in a, a house northwest of Portland, Oregon, who had in it, well in excess of 100 guns, okay? He collected, for example, M1s, which was the standard United States military rifle of World War II. And if they were made by a lot of different American companies because during that wartime, they just farmed out this production. Well, me, I'm not allowed to own guns anymore. I'm what's called a felon. I'm not, legally, in America, I can't own a gun. But 
lots of people have guns. And I don't consider a person who has 100 guns necessarily any more dangerous than a person that has one. Okay? When they talk about stockpiling weapons, that doesn't phase me. That's a, that guy's a collector. Okay? Now, we've had an incident recently in Las Vegas, which I'm sure everybody's heard about, which is a problem. We don't know why he did what he did. I have no idea. Maybe you... But it's gotten way, way too common these days. Back in 1966, I think, there was a guy who famously got onto a top of a tower in the, at Texas University. They called him the Texas Tower Shooter. And he ended up killing six or seven people. And that was so shocking, because back then it didn't happen. And uh, I remember that. Not immediately, but you know, we didn't have very fast, you know, communication back then. I probably was in school at the time, and I was probably a thousand miles away. But, yeah, those incidents do occur. That's true. But the problem is, if you try to ban guns, you'll only, you'll get those incidents as well. Uh, and, what's that? Uh, maybe, maybe we'll learn. Maybe we'll learn. Yeah, okay. Well, do you think that a person who owns 10 guns is, inher is 10 times as dangerous as the guy who's owned one? Well, if you look at the mass killings, yes. Well, it's true that people who kill a lot of people tend to, well, they can own a lot of guns. That doesn't uh, mean... Sorry, I, I have another question. and. Um, I, I've got the microphone, so maybe, um, yeah. All right. <laughs> um, yeah. Good. Um, I think that your system is pretty much um, undemocratic because, um, from my point of view, um, the incentivation for this assassination is money. So. Um, People that have a big, big purse, that have a big money, like Bill Gates or Peter Thiel, so they will have uh, a bigger influence on politics than ordinary people that don't have so much money. So what you're doing is simply you're building a channel to influence politics by money, and there's no transparency because the donations are anonymous. So um, uh, if you uh, if you donate money to political parties, let's say in Germany then uh, these donations are published and then um, there is kind of an oversight by an informed public. But in your case, there are anonymous uh, donations to influence the politics with money and there's no, no transparency. I don't see how this can improve uh, the political system. By eliminating the whole concept of, of politics, taking away the principle, well, I'm a libertarian. I've been a libertarian all my life. I realized I was a libertarian in 1975. Libertarians are motivated by something called the non-aggression principle or the non-initiation of force principle. It's been humorously described as the rights of my fist end at your nose. Okay? I can swing my fist all around until I get to your nose, in which case my right ends, all right? In other words, non-aggression. We have a society where almost everything today is done by ultimate threat of government force. If government force, they don't show up automatically. If you don't pay your taxes, they'll send you some threatening mail. If you send it, if they still don't send your, if you don't send your taxes, they go to your bank and take your bank account. Or if you don't have a bank account, you have gold, they break in and take it. So all, ultimately, governments are based on the ultimate threat of violence to you if they don't get what they want. I want to end that. The end of threats. Promo promotion of a libertarian society. Now, I, when I became, or when I realized I was a libertarian in 75, it wasn't like the libertarian literature convinced me 
When I read that literature, I knew I was already there. I had been, all, I was, I think I was like 17 years old at the time. I said, hey, this is what I've been thinking all my life. Uh, why is it this, this way of running things is not the way people run? And I, what I'm really trying to do effectively is eliminate the concept of politics. Politics is buying and selling influence. And I want to eliminate that concept. I want a very, uh, a minimal thing that you might call government. We're going to still have roads. Somebody has to build the roads after you paid for. We're going to have street signs. We'll have street lights. Uh, past that, do we need government? I don't know if we do. And that's part of what my Jim Bell project is going to implement or design. How does society work when you no longer have that coercion? It's something that has to happen, the, the research and the development. Any more questions? Okay, uh, there is a question from, uh, from Anonymous. I'm going to ask this question behind of, him, behind of him. So the question is, how do you want to prevent existing politician to use assassination market to kill another politician? For example, how do you want to prevent uh, Donald Trump to kill um, uh, Putin and, you know. Uh, personally, I think this is not a problem, but this is just a question. Okay. That's a good question. How do you prevent it? That assumes, does it not, you want to prevent it. Do you really want to prevent that? I don't know. <laughs> Myself, I don't want to prevent that. I want them, I, if they want to kill each other off, that's fine with me. I wish they'd started to do it a long, long time ago. Uh, second thing is, the, the system is open in the sense that the donations are known, okay? You know, the, 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 the donation amounts have been known. The difference is nobody knows who is actually making the donation. If people in some far off country are offended by something that an American politician does, they will donate anonymously to a fund to see an American politician dead. But nobody will know who actually made the donations. Are they people from that far off country? Or are they Americans who don't like what that politician is doing? And when eventually, if the contract needs to get up, you might say, will it be a far off country politician assassin who will fly the owner's flight into America and do the job? No, probably not. It'll probably be a, a, an American who will do the job. And it'll be like Uber for assassinations. <laughs> uh, excuse me? So, some, hold on. Somebody wants to describe the assassination market as a GoFundMe for, for murder. <laughs> All right, all right. Uh, when we were talking about the non-aggression principle, I think that uh, if you can't actually enforce that only government officials can be targeted by your system, uh, aren't you actually violent, violating the NAP of the whole planet? Uh, uh, my answer to that is a person who works for government is already accepting a, a, a paycheck full of s government stolen dollars. So he is also violating the non-aggression principle merely by doing that. I need to add, however, clearly that doesn't mean they are all on the same level of violence. In, in my country, in America, a large number of teachers are government employees. Do I have some, my, my mother used to be a teacher decades ago. Do I have some objection to teachers as government employees? Well, they are about the most innocuous kind of government employees there typically are. I would propose that people who worked for government law enforcement agencies, I'm talking about the CIA or FBI, 
or the, I, the, the American Internal Revenue Service, the tax collectors of America. I think those will be by far the most likely targets. It isn't like you're going to have a pot of a little chits with the name of all government employees, including teachers, and you just throw in a hand and pull out one and, you know, Mary Jones, first grade teacher in Hoboken, New Jersey. No, that's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, uh, it's going to be the ones that probably really deserve it, okay? And after, I'd say after a year or two, when most of the scores will have been settled, mostly by people agreeing to quit their job, pay the money back, and apologize for what they did. You know, it's like the truth and reconciliation uh, thing of South Africa, or what, what happened in East Germany. Uh, you know, uh, they've, they've gotten along after that. But I think a person who collects money with the government paycheck has already aggressed against you, and therefore you're not initiating force to stop him from doing so. You would hope that he would stop on his own, but like I say, the, the, the primary targets will be people not merely accepting the paycheck, but do, doing something beyond that. Uh, the people who planned the Waco incident in, uh, in Waco, Texas back in 1995, which happened, by the way, a month or two after I thought of my AP essay and, and wrote the first part of it. But those would be an excellent set of targets. Timothy McVeigh, the guy who blew up the Oklahoma City uh, federal building, I, I use him as an example of a person. He ended up killing like 186 people who were mostly, you'd call them fairly innocent. They might have been government employees, they were accepting stolen tax dollars. But if I could have talked to Timothy McVeigh before this, I would have said, Mr. McVeigh, would you rather kill 186 relatively innocent people or write down on this piece of paper, name 20 different people who were responsible for the Waco incident? Now, does anybody remember the Waco incident here? I know it happened in a different country uh, it's a long time ago, but it was, uh, okay. Look into it if you're interested, Waco. I said, if I could say to Timothy McVeigh, could you either, do you either want to kill 186 ordinarily innocent me people or 20 named people that you want to kill, that actually were responsible? Would, I, would you rather have a high body count or, you, or target a small number like 20 very, very guilty people? Does anybody think that Timothy McVeigh would have chosen the former to kill 186 or 68, 168 innocent people? Anybody? No. Does it, did it, do you think that he would have chosen to kill 20 very specifically named people? Come on, guys. He, one or the other. Ah, uh, never mind. I, okay. The point is that he, he didn't have, in his mind, he didn't have an alternative. He couldn't kill 20 very specifically named people. So he killed 168 relatively innocent people. I am saying give people like that the ability to target the 20, the 30 very guilty people rather than feeling that the only thing they can do is set off a 2,000 pound bomb a few tens of feet from a huge federal government filled with relatively innocent people. So um, I have to apologize for not reading your uh, your essay first, but uh, and may, so maybe you have addressed this. But uh, hypothetically, if a target dies and there are no predictions against that target, uh, what happens to the rest of the money? <sighs> Well, of course, when I'm talking about this system, the organization, an organization, what I, I call it an AP organization, 
the one that actually takes the donation. They will have their own rules and policies and practices. And there may be multiple ones of these organizations. There might be a dozen organizations. They could decide, if somebody dies and nobody comes in and claims it, or say somebody dies and it wasn't clearly responsible for it by anybody, there may be a mechanism set up to, to, to provide a refund or possibly the money would be distributed over other names. Uh, again, this is something that the organization itself would want to do. I mean, we'd want to decide. Though I thought of the system, that doesn't mean I get to dictate the way these operations work. If you have a dozen of these assassination politics type organizations, one of them does this policy, and another one does this policy. It'll be like different restaurants or different, uh, you know, uh, different uh, stores, grocery stores. Everybody acts it a little bit differently. Well, fine. That's that's competition. So, uh, so how the money actually gets given back, if it does, would be up to that organization's policy. I did anticipate that. Some people, if they get a big enough bounty on them, will decide, well, I'm dead anyway, so I'm going to predict my own death and then cause it and donate the money to their wife or children or parents or whatever. Okay? They call that cheating the hangman. I don't know. Is that wrong? So you were talking about some kind of centralized court system to decide who's targetable and who's not. At that point, doesn't that kind of defeat the purpose of the decentralized organization? Doesn't it just become whoever controls the courts controls politics? Hold on. I, I described the fact that it would be a court system, a, 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 a post-AP court system, but it wouldn't just be one court system. It would be competing court systems. Let's call them dispute resolution systems. If you and somebody else has an accident, somebody might actually be guilty, but most people would not think that being killed is a proper punishment for being guilty of a car accident. All right, if a person gets a lot of car accidents and doesn't have any responsibility forever, or for, for these, donations might build up on him. He might be much prefer, might much prefer to go into a court, a court, not the court, and take his chances. And they would work like ordinarily courts work. They take witnesses. They do. They consider the issues, investigators, and eventually that guy may be sentenced to pay a fine, or may actually be fined to be locked up in the post AP version of a prison. Fine. If that's the way they want to choose it, they will choose it that way. So it's one of those things that a society will have to be, decide to do. But remember, we're not talking one court system. We're talking about multiple court systems, three or four or five. And if one court system ever get a, gets abusive in one way or another, people will simply never choose it to be the dispute resolution system. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, so some people say that politics is show business for ugly people. <laughs> and uh, the, the results of elections are uh, popularity contests. And this is kind of like a negative uh, uh, popularity contest. <laughs> and, and, uh, so um, like your version of uh, AP system would only accept donations on politicians but uh, the question is if someone builds uh, such system uh, it could eliminate people who are simply not popular so wh I, what okay. would be your reaction to that? Or actually, I, when I said that if I run the system initially for the first again I'd say for a, a year or two it would, nay, it would accept donations only against politicians or government employees. And the reason is that 
unless you have an alternate court system in place already, you can't easily determine great guilt versus a little bit of guilt. So it seemed to me, when I thought about this idea tw over 20 years ago, for a short time, you know, like I say, a year or two, the best way is to target only those people who are genuinely guilty because they accept a government employee, uh, a government paycheck. Now, for a year or two, a lot of them are going to be gone or resigned or whatever. Once the governments effectively are unable to operate, once they've been dissolved effectively, at that point, society has a task of setting up these multiple courts, competing voluntary courts that, that will compete for your business, okay? Effectively, you're not forced to go into that court. You go into the court because if you've done something that's a little bit wrong, but everybody's saying it's a lot wronger, if you go into that court, you can plead your case and maybe you'll get a far lower sentence a fine of money or a, a term of confinement in prison rather than being killed, okay? You don't normally expect to be killed over a minor incident. Well, fine. We replace that with something that a court decides, and it isn't a centralized single court. We have competing court systems. The competition is what will provide the fairness in the operation. If a court ever becomes unfair, people won't want to go there. So uh, another point that's worth making relative to this is that uh, it's not simply uh, death that can be uh, can have a bounty. So, for example, if one of these organizations, one of these AP organizations, is perceived as being a bad actor it is also possible to put a bounty out for the information leading to basically unmasking the people running the AP organization. That's a possibility. Which could be, could be used to prevent, could be a mechanism to prevent uh, this being used against unpopular people or being used unfairly. Mm -hmm. One of the things I thought of before I wrote part one of my essay is that if government, well, well, because there are mul potentially multiple ones of these AP operations, imagine one organization will just take any name, regardless. The other organization has careful criteria. Well, most, I believe that the careful organization, their pr prices will be lower. More of, the mo or more of the money will go to the assassin, less of the, uh, the total cost will be lower. The uncareful, uncaring organization, their prices will be much higher. They will take a huge cut. Why? Because there won't be nearly as many of those organizations, okay? So you'll have to pay a hell of a lot more to get somebody killed in these what, what I call unethical organizations. And in addition, if you're the only person on earth that says that person needs to die, you're going to have to put out a lot of money now, aren't you? You know, a, a thousand euros, 10,000 euros, 100,000 euros. But if that person that you want to see dead actually is a bad person, and millions of people, or at least thousands of people, think he's a bad person, you don't have to put out 100,000 euros. You might put out one euro. This system will be set up in a way to be, make it very hard for one person to just suddenly decide randomly, that guy is bad, or that guy is bad, or that guy is bad. But it'll be very easy to target people who are genuinely bad. If you can convince a thousand of your best friends to donate 10 euros each, hey, you're, you've gotten somewhere, you know. But if you're, if you're the outlier, if you're the individual 
who has the odd quirk, and you don't, you're not going to find it very easy to target anybody because the, the money is split ordinarily among good targets. A target that should be targeted will have lots and lots of donors. Now somebody, one, one pipe proposed when they were originally discussing the idea, Jim, why don't you just have a restriction on the size of donation? Anybody, you know, the maximum of, say, a 10-year-old donation. Anybody know what's wrong with that idea? Come on, people. Huh? Exactly. And I, I went through that idea long before I first published my essay. Yes, you can't, that's an artificial limit. Uh, if these ano donations are anonymous, you can make a thousand 10 euro donations. And yet, so it's not practical to say that there's a maximum donation, okay? Because any such donation system that's intended to be honest and anonymous will not, will not be stopped by that. But the thing that will be stopped is if one person is the only person that wants to see you dead, then he'll have to fork over all the total costs, which will be high. If a, if a, a million people want to see you dead, they, they only have to give you a, a dime each, a million of them, and that's probably going to be enough. Can you see there's a huge difference between those two scenarios? Hello. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, why do you think uh, do we need uh, specialized assassination politics markets? Because Pavel uh, had a talk today uh, about anonymous decentralized prediction markets. As, and if I understand it right, uh, these prediction markets are something like a generalization of these assassination markets because I can bet on anything, like I can bet on baseball, soccer, and uh, even I could bet on some, somebody's death. So, uh, wouldn't it be better to have these anonymous decentralized prediction markets when there are no rules, no operators, and these... Better? Could, uh, uh, I'm not sure I understand. You say, you're talking about okay, sports? Okay, I'm, I'm going to explain to you, uh, Jim. So, uh, today I had a presentation about a uh, concept of anonymous decentralized the decentralized prediction markets as a okay. general concept and you have the specific implementation mm -hmm. of this concept so i was just thinking uh, i had uh, this uh, i was thinking about um, about using this prediction market anonymous prediction market for uh, perfect corruption because thanks to prediction market you can you can achieve in the similar way for example perfect corruption you know, you know so you can you can make anonymous economic incentive for some politician uh, to uh, to be corrupted because for example you bet I don't know su such amount of money that uh, you on this day you will uh, you will okay. hold for the so so I just uh, so the question is that these uh, uh, the, pre the the concept of British market is quite general. You know, it's you know, it's a general, and and this is the specific implementation you know, for martyrs. Okay. And um, so the question is, what do you think about general and a general idea of prediction market? Here's my here's my 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 comment about that. The solution to corrupt politicians, one solution is to simply not give politicians the power to do things that somebody else might want to donate or to give money to in the form of a bribe. A politician that has little or no power cannot collect bribes because you can't buy influence to a per In order to buy influence, you have to have influence to begin with, all right? You don't need to kill a politician who has no power. They're called figureheads. They don't really do anything. They don't accept bribes because they can't give you anything. The only politicians that really can accept bribes are ones that have enough power to actually give you 
Gee, Merry Christmas. What is that? I don't know. <laughs> okay, anyway, as I said, politicians that are, are, are without power are uncor <laughs> they're uncorruptible by definition because they can't do anything for you. The problem is when we start giving politicians power, they start using it. Politicians didn't have a lot of power in the 1800s, for example, in America, all right? A lot of America was just one big wilderness, you know. People didn't see a politician. You know, they might have occasionally heard of one on a, in a newspaper. Uh, people in that era just didn't have influence that they could sell, mostly. There were some exceptions. Uh, I'm in favor of not giving politicians uh, power or, or dropping the power to the minimal level that you need to have. Um, for some reason, something popped into my head. <laughs> a comment, a joke about, a, about an honest politician. <laughs> an honest politician is one who stays bought. Think about it for a bit. <laughs> an honest politician is one who stays bought. In other words, you pay him money to do something, he does it for you. If he changes his mind later on, he's clearly not honest. <laughs> oh, I don't know. What can I say? Okay, I have a question. Uh, you said that uh, your system will be prevent that bad politician uh, wants to kill another bad politician. If uh, try to imagine if I am the bad politician and bring, for example, one million people, which be manipulated by me, and send you one euro per each, one million euro to kill some another politician. How do you prevent it? I don't. <laughs> well, so, so everybody. Uh, hold on, hold on. That was a joke, actually. The only reason you'd want to collect that money is if that politician be kill killed had done something that involved influence. If he doesn't have influence, no one would want to kill him. In addition, the first politician who collects all this money, why does he want to collect this money in the first place? I mean, if a person has money, ordinarily what you want to do is keep it and spend it for yourself. There, there must have been a reason that that particular person had a reason to collect a million euros to, to kill the other politician or whatever it would cost. Underlying that is where the problem really is, that somebody, there's something going on that requires influence and people are trying to get that influence. If a politician, if I'm trying to, if I'm a factory owner and I'm trying to build a new factory somewhere, and if they're regulating me, and I'm considering bribing the politician or getting rid of the politician. It's because somebody gave that politician political influence to do what he's doing right now. And the goal here is, if somebody, if, if one politician has a motivation to kill another politician, it's because somebody has too much power and somebody's exercising too much power or wants to exercise too much power. Okay. And probably the last question, if there are some questions. Okay, so in that situation, I would like to thank you a lot, Jim, for your interesting presentation and very comprehensive answer. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. We are really happy that you came here finally, because many people couldn't believe that you, you came here and you are finally here. So big applause, thank you a lot.